Good morning. Uh, my name is Renaud Forestier. Thanks for coming this early. I know it was hard for me. Uh, just a disclaimer before I start, you're going to see a lot of Lego um, figures and all uh, in this talk. I'm not working on a Lego game. Uh, it's just that the other day my kid is four and he was playing with Legos. And I bought him this like CD uh, pack with tons of figures and he came up to me with this one and he was like, Dad, that, that's you. And I was like, you know, like, <laughs> actually it is. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm one of us here. I used to do lots of things. I started as a programmer, uh, doing websites and all. I moved to illustration, and then to uh, UI design, then UX design, studied ergonomics, and um, I've been a Google developer expert in UX and UI for the past five years. And I also run uh, More Mountains, which is my one-man army studio, uh, with which I do games for clients, game jams. Uh, looks like that. It's my shortest trailer ever. And I also do stuff on the Asset Store. You may have seen this around. Uh, there's the Corgi engine, which is like a platformer solution, top-down engine, a bunch of others. And for the last six months, uh, I've been working at Ubisoft Montreal, uh, where I lead a prototype team that works on an unannounced project, which I won't be able to show you anything of, of course. Um, so yeah, that prototype team uh, is made of Maxime, myself, Manu, and Alejandro, which, is, uh, which are the best people I've ever worked with. So I'm super lucky. Uh, what we do is we work within a much bigger team. We cut that large scope into pieces, and we iterate on each of these tiny um, uh, aspects of the game, focusing mostly on gameplay, game feel, that kind of stuff. And we try to spend a maximum of two weeks on each uh, feature. And last year at Unite LA, I did a talk uh, focusing on how we work with that team, how we do um, uh, our fast iteration and how we try to get results super fast. And that was most of the stuff that was covered in that, that talk. It's on YouTube if you want to see uh, fun videos and stuff. And uh, today I'm going to focus on only one of these aspects which is making your game awesome. So we'll start with some theory about micro-interactions, uh, which is not something as complex as it may sound. Uh, then we'll look at some case studies deconstructing some of the um, uh, features uh, that you can increase with some, some juice. And then we'll have a look at the, the toolbox we use to do that and that you may be able to use yourself quite soon. So first of all, uh, micro-interactions. So micro-interactions is a term that was coined by a guy named Dan Saffer in a book aptly named Micro-Interactions. Uh, that's his definition of it. But um, it's really, a micro-interaction is the combination of a trigger and a feedback. Uh, a trigger can be something that is uh, created by the user, maybe presses a, a button or says something in a microphone or whatever. And then there can be system triggers, which is like uh, my character died or something like that. And if you provide, or the system provides, a feedback to that trigger, then it's a micro-interaction. You've seen micro-interactions a lot. They're in every app, or at least the good ones uh, that you use on a daily basis. It can be a, a pull to refresh. Uh, it can be the like on Twitter, on Facebook, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, the, the heart could just change color, but it, it bumps and also it makes it more enjoyable. An alarm clock is a trigger. The system tells you it's 6 a.m. and you should uh, wake up if you want uh, to be on time for your talk today. And uh, a video player is not a, a micro-interaction, it's a feature, but pressing the pause or play button on a video player would be a micro-interaction. So why does it matter? Well, uh, of course it lets you tell the player or the user that something uh, that he pressed has happened, you know, that you registered 
that input. It lets you communicate on system status. Something happened in my product. It lets the user understand causes and consequences. So that's the rules of your product, of your game. And that's really critical because if the user of a system understands the rules, then it's likely to be usable and it's likely to be understood by the player, which makes it usually uh, more enjoyable. And you can use that as an opportunity to delight and welcome, provide joy to your user. So that's a good way to define your brand's identity, your game's identity. In games, uh, good examples of that are, like, I think my, my favorite one is Mario's jump. Every time you jump, you press a button. Mario goes in the air, of course, but uh, you also get that nice sound. You get contextual animations, depending on the number of jumps or the position you're in. Uh, you get, you know, puffs of smoke in recent Marios, and uh, it just makes you want to jump over and over and over again. Another one would be uh, God of War's axe throwing. There's a lot that happens. Uh, there are videos online deconstructing exactly what happens when you throw the axe, how it comes back, how the screen shakes, and so on. Um, this is from Anthem, and that's what happens when you trigger the jetpack. And they could just have uh, the jetpack go and, and you fly faster or something, but you know, there's this nice camera work and uh, a lot that actually happens. You get particles, you get really something that makes you feel powerful. Now you're Iron Man. And of course, there's games like uh, Vlambeer's uh, trousers, which are just packed with micro-interactions and feedbacks all over. And that makes for really, really enjoyable games. Um, this uh, on, on the right is uh, a demo I, I put in the top-down engine recently. It's, uh, I think, a completely original gameplay. I don't think it's ever been done again. But um, uh, obviously, you put bombs and you destroy you know, the, the stuff like in Bomberman. Um, and it's a good example of, I think, a, mi a micro-interaction done right. Uh, you put your bomb, it starts blinking, it explodes, uh, makes some debris and shake stuff. So there's a lot that happens every time you just put the bomb. When working on your game and trying to improve your micro-interactions, the first thing you should do is focus on your core features. Focus on the stuff that the player will do over and over again in your game. Um, let's say you're a platformer, focus on the jumps. Let's say you're a bomberman, uh, focus on putting bombs down. And you want to make that actually fun and rewarding for the player to uh, to do because you want to let them know doing this action is actually what you're supposed to do. So that reinforces your core mechanics. And it's also very important to focus on consistency and gradualness, if that's even a word. Um, the idea is that uh, consistency is really the idea that, uh, let's say, in this game, when the bomb is about to explode, it flickers. So now, in my game's language, flicker means danger. And it would be a bad idea to then use that same flicker for gaining health, for example. You want to be consistent on that. Uh, and gradualness is the idea that not everything has to be a fireworks, and you want your more rewarding or critical actions to be really big and explosive, but maybe just, um, uh, I don't know, you know, the, the countdown to the end of the game shouldn't maybe have huge particles every time it passes a second. And when working on that, you want to, at least at the start, turn everything up to 11. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen teams you know, working on that and uh, being too cautious, being like, no, maybe it's too much. No, it's rarely too much. Uh, and it's, it's, it's nice to just start with something big and tone it down instead of trying to do the other way. A question I get a lot is, when is a feature juicy enough? You know, when, have I put enough juice in my game? The problem is that it's not an exact science, right? It's uh, something that you feel, it's very subjective. So a nice way to know if you've actually uh, accomplished your goal is to just test with real users. You've been working on that jump for a long time, uh, hours, days maybe, and you, you're not objective enough now to judge if it's good or not. So 
put it in the hands of, of the players and look at their face. If they have a smile the first time they, they do the action you want them to do, uh, you're likely on the right path. If they're not smiling, do it again, because it's, uh, it's obviously not working. Um, and then you just add layers of satisfaction. So you, of course, your character goes up, but then you want to have uh, secondary stuff happening, and you want particles, and you want that, that kind of things that will surprise the player and bring them joy. Uh, and that's, yeah, does it spark joy? You know, that's a good question to ask, and that's the words of famous Japanese philosopher. So now maybe let's look at some uh, case studies. Uh, this is some work we did. We, we took like two weeks to uh, help the team on Tom Clancy's Elite Squad at, at Ubisoft. They wanted uh, some research done on uh, some parts of the game. So it's a, a five versus five mobile game where you have soldiers shooting at each other. It's a, it's a bad summary. Uh, but basically, the, the idea is that. And they wanted to have airstrikes and, and a shield, so we did a bit of research on trying to get that a bit more juicy. So here's our basic airstrike. Um, the user targets a position on the field, and you get an airstrike. And it looks like that. And it's fine, you know, like it lets the player know that there's been an impact on that general area. But we can make it better. So now we've got bigger explosions and we've got remnants after the airstrike passes. Now we add some foreshadowing. It's an airstrike, so there's likely planes. So before even seeing any explosion, we have these shadows of the planes. It's actually very cheap. Uh, there's not even a plane model. Then we add some more debris. So uh, that now that we've got rocks flying in the air and we've got this scorched earth afterwards. And now it's starting to feel like an airstrike. Let's just do that again. And we can make it better. So now when we put it in the game, we've got these sounds and all going on. And now the player feels like you know, something actually happened. Uh, moving on, we wanted to try something on the shield. Because doing an airstrike, you know, it's satisfying. It's an airstrike. It's easy to get right. Um, but a shield is less, you know, at least to me, it's less, uh, less amazing. It's less uh, enjoyable. You're not shooting or exploding anything, so it's, is it even fun? But uh, so we started with just a shield. And it's already looking nice. Uh, it's got this uh, refraction going on and this glow and it's blue and it lets you know that it's protective and nice. Cuddly. So uh, we just add an animation to that. It's something that the player will target one of his uh, dudes and just uh, goes over it. Now we've got sound. It looks sci-fi. And we've got this additional Energy things. What's this thing made of? Nobody knows. And now we work on effects because you're going to be shot at, right? Other people are, are targeting you with their guns, and we wanted something that lets you know that this shield is actually armor. We add more VFX on the sides and assemble everything. So now when you get shot at, uh, the shield, every time a bullet comes in, it closes, and bullets bounce off the shield. So that makes it like a, a nice companion, you know, maybe it's nanotech, whatever, but it's alive. And it's, uh, it's just fun to watch it and see it protect your guys. And we also did a bit of work on the uh, the menus, okay, which is usually not the most uh, enjoyable part on the, of the game, you know, not the one where you'd expect a lot of juice. Um, 
And this is what the menu looks like. That's where you buy packs of stuff. And um, we wanted it to look welcoming. Uh, that's where players are going to be spending their money. So uh, uh, that, that should be a welcoming place, right? Uh, and so even without any interaction, I wanted the menu to feel alive. And we've got these animations, uh, like on the currencies tab at the top, you see it blinks and all. And we could have done that by just animating the, the glow, uh, the, the emission, in this case of the sprite. Uh, but it was more fun to sync it to the music. So I've got this class that I can use that uh, cuts the spectrum of the background music into pieces and then I can hook every aspect of my game to one of these values. So uh, in this case I think I, I took one of the leftmost bars and every bit of the UI is actually synced to the height of the sound. So that's a very easy way actually to uh, get a nice animation because the sound does it for you. So, and if you change the soundtrack, it updates your animation automatically. So it's quite simple. And it's just fun to look at that, inspe uh, that inspector thing. I, I spend hours just looking at that sound and being like, maybe I choose that bar. Uh, so it's a nice tool to have. Then we worked on how the menu arrives. Uh, we did this sort of 3D effect, which is actually a 3D effect. It's not sort of a 3D effect, it's just 3D. And I, I've been working on UI in Unity for the past five years or so, and uh, I just realized last month that I could just do 3D. So uh, uh, you learn new stuff every day. So this effect is actually uh, super simple. It's a scroll right, and it just rotates like that. So it's cheap, easy, but it looks like, it looks like something. And then when you actually buy something, you want that to be rewarding. Uh, some games, especially on mobile, they'll open the Apple or Google uh, pop-up window that lets you uh, buy the stuff, and then it's not even a thank you, you know? Uh, we wanted that to be a bit more rewarding. That's something you want the player to do again. So uh, you want to put some juice on that. And now that we had worked on Elite Squad, we had all these nice models. So I was like, oh, I'm going to do some demos with them because they actually look nice. And I'm, I'm really bad at 3D modeling. So uh, uh, every time I get a chance to uh, play around with some nice models, I, I take the occasion. So uh, in this demo, I wanted to show you how you can improve on simple stuff like movement. Uh, in this scene, I have this guy walking around with a gun, looking nice, and it's working, right? It's uh, moving in the right direction, facing where it's going. I've got animations when it's walking and an idle animation when it's not. I could stop there, but uh, using Unity, if you just add some blend trees, you now get this um, really nice natural animation. And if you add contextual actions that are just automatically triggered. Every time I get close to a cover, I trigger a vault. And just walking around feels natural now. It feels effortless. All that is done using just uh, Mixamo animation, so it's extremely free. Um, and it looks nice. And then, of course, you want to shoot people, because that's what people do. And, um, and that can be made very enjoyable uh, in, in games. Uh, that's a, probably the, the only place you should be shooting at people. Um, but yeah, just uh, make it fun. Add shells that fall so uh, you know where you've been shooting people at. Let the corpses on the ground. Make them ragdoll, because it's fun to see people fall and uh, be all like puppets. Next, I wanted to do a car. But I don't know why I, I went with the helicopter. And it's actually a car. It's using my high road engine, and the copter is like on giant wheels that you don't see. It's a nice way to, <laughs> probably the easiest way uh, to do a, a flying thing like that, that flies on a plane or something. And so, yeah, a copter. Um, and this is a helicopter. It flies. Uh, you see the shadow. It moves in the right direction. It, 
It's already a helicopter. But you can make it better. You can make it better but by simply adding a wobble to the model and some banking when it turns. And now when it flies around, you're like, hey, that looks more or less like a, a chopper would behave. I'm no expert in helicopters, but you know, I've seen movies. Uh, and it feels like it's being propelled by its own blades or whatever plane, uh, helicopters do. Then I want it to look nicer, so I, I just uh, opened Photoshop, drew like a, a cross and blurred it, you know, radial blur, and it's just a sprite that I put on it and make it turn, but it looks nicer than just the actual blades in 3D rotating. And then you add some particles. Uh, this is just using Unity's legacy particle system, uh, and it's just spheres. But I move the particle system around as I fly, you know, raycast it, raycasting to the ground and getting that, that raycast position. And it feels like when I turn, the, the blades are actually producing that dust at the right spot or the spot you would expect that smoke to be. And some smoke for the engine or whatever. Do helicopters produce smoke? I don't know. But it looks nice, you know, it gives you a, a sense of where you came from. And then, you know, some different particles. And uh, something I really like is the idea that every time you, you do an action, it should have an impact on your environment. So now when I get close to the trees, without doing anything myself except being there, uh, the trees react. And of course I can shoot that stuff uh, because it's uh, what helicopters do, right? And, and yeah, just working on, on these trees, it, it makes you want to do it again, to fly again and push stuff away and maybe we should have uh, animals running around and stuff like that. You create life and as a player it feels uh, very fun and it's, it's actually uh, quite, quite cheap, you know, once you've done the, the shader that makes the, the trees move then you can put tons of trees and it's just and less fun. So now what about the, the toolbox? Last year at Unite LA, I spoke about my MM Feedbacks library that I use in most of my projects. It's uh, something I created initially for the Corgi engine and top-down engine. They're included in the package and I was like, uh, oh, you know, um, I'll show you this and it's gonna be available uh, soon on, on GitHub and it's been a year. Uh, but, uh, but the time is, is actually coming. So um, what's, what's MM Feedbacks? Uh, it's um, a library of feedback that you can use in your macro interactions. It's super easy to use. It's uh, workflow similar to post-processing effects. You just uh, create one feedback, one feedbacks actually, and, and you add feedbacks to that. It makes more sense when you, when you play with it. And um, the, there's like a library of 30 different feedbacks and it's extendable so you can create your own feedbacks that are specific to your game. Um, maybe every time you do a certain action you want your, I don't know, your, your character to do something very specific that other games don't. You can create your own feedback for that. It comes packed with a lot of, of uh, feedbacks that cover uh, most of the common use cases. Uh, like this Iron Man guy on, on the right, it's uh, done only with MM feedbacks. Uh, so of course there's a model and uh, some particles, but the movement, the effects, the, uh, the camera move, everything is just MM feedbacks. I, I wouldn't say do everything with MM feedbacks, but uh, that's the kind of stuff you can do with it. So it comes in different flavors. Uh, the stuff that focuses on objects, you can alter the position, rotation, scale um, of an object. All that is done using, you know, you specify a time, you say, I want my object to go from here to here. Uh, there's different options, but usually it comes also with an animation curve, so you can get all sorts of uh, unique movement that feel actually cool. You can enable, uh, disable stuff, you can flicker renderers. There are controllers that let you control any float, any vector in any mono behavior. Uh, same thing for shaders. You want something to actually blink. You want to maybe uh, increase the emission intensity of your material. 
And then there's a lot of stuff that is related to camera, uh, stuff for Cinemachine, which is a um, library I really, really love, um, and a lot of stuff to control post-processing effects. So you can get, uh, you know, maybe when you, when you shoot that stuff, you desaturate uh, the whole picture. And then there's a bunch of stuff that doesn't go into any category. Uh, there's haptic feedbacks, uh, if you've got the right asset for that. But, um, also events, uh, time control, you can freeze frame, you can slow down time for half a second or something, uh, trigger physics, sounds, all sorts of stuff. And so this is how it works. Uh, for this demo, I just want a cube to jump. And uh, using a feedback, a, a position feedback, I just make it move. And it looks like that, and that's it. Thank you. Now we can make it better. So uh, the first thing I do is I add uh, a feedback that targets the scale of my object. So now I simulate squash and stretch by having uh, the X and Z scales go down and then larger and you know it's squishy. Using the same feedback, I add more anticipation. So I'm just tweaking curves at this point. Then some screen shake. Everybody loves screen shake. So when you, your, your cube hits the ground, it feels like it has some weight. Landing particles. So I, I just have this particle system that is idle, and every time I hit the ground, I trigger it. I say, play. Uh, and all that is done because each feedback has timer options. So you can say, do this after 0.5 seconds or something. Now some charge sparks because you know this, this cube is like maybe a super saiyan cube or something and it sort of collects energy before jumping. I had a secondary rotation while in the air because that's what cubes do. A bit of more screen shake when the cube is charging. Um, there I had, I think it's bloom and, uh, and color grading. So uh, yeah, when, when the cube charges, I increase the bloom, desaturate the image, and I give this result, whose quality is uh, debatable, but you know, something happens. Then I make the, um, the cube's material flicker. Add some sounds. And now it feels like it has more weight, right? It's, Part of our world. Again, trying to trigger stuff in the environment is always fun. So now every time the cube lands, all the tiny cubes jump around. And this is on GitHub right now, which is uh, a long time coming, but it's all documented. You can get it for free. Um, it's a fun tool to add to your toolbox. And if you've got you know, uh, comments or feedbacks or want to contribute, uh, feel free to let me know using your preferred choice of communication. So in conclusion, um, I, I often get asked, really, uh, how, how do I do juice? And again, that's not something that is very um, Scientific. It's, it's more something that you, you feel. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, provide some value and, and let's come up with some sort of, of checklist. So I, 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 I don't cook, you know, I don't, I don't know how to cook anything. Um, so I went to a website and I wanted to do a recipe or something. So I went to a website and the first recipe I found was uh, the recipe for orange juice. Uh, because like an idiot, I typed uh, juice recipe in, in Google. And uh, I don't know what to expect, but so to do orange juice, you need oranges and you press them. That's, uh, that was the recipe. I wanted to look at what does a recipe look like, you know, and bad example maybe. Uh, so to do juice uh, in, in, in games, the first thing you want to do is focus on the timing, pick the right timing. And by that, I mean not only the the duration of your effect, your animation, your whatever, uh, but also at what point in your game should that happen? Probably the most uh, used action. And then you make it consistent. 
you focus on deciding on a feedback language for your game. Flicker means danger. Uh, fast movement means strongness or you know, high impact. And you try to apply that to every part of your game. You add visuals, sound, haptic feedbacks, all that kind of stuff. And, and then you add secondary reactions. Sure, when you jump, there's a puff of smoke. That's a, that's a given. But what else happens in the world? What are the consequences of your actions or the player's actions on the rest of the world? Maybe when you, when you shoot at a wall, there's sparks that come down, and they are physics-based. So they uh, collide with the ground, and that makes just everything a bit more enjoyable. And you just shake that. You shake that mix, uh, and you add more stuff, and you add screen shakes, and you add everything until you feel like it brings joy to people. Add some randomness, you know, like this pink thing. Uh, dude, I don't know what it is. But it, every time it goes through the clouds, or the spheres, because it's just spheres, uh, it makes them move randomly using physics. So um, that's just fun to look at and a bit surprising every time. And uh, if you add randomness and contextual actions and have your uh, game evolve every time the player is in, in a new position in the world or in a new context, then people are going to be happier. And then you chill for one hour because I thought it was funny. That's my best cooking joke. I forgot one slide. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested about micro-interactions, feedback, Game feel. Uh, I have the books for you because they are uh, aptly named. So the first one is uh, by Dan Safo. It's called Micro Interactions. It really f doesn't talk about games, uh, but it talks about apps and you know uh, interactive products in general. Uh, everything that is in it applies to games. Really, it applies to menus, but it also applies. The general logic uh, applies to I think every product. Even even physical ones could benefit from that. And the other one is by uh, Steve Swink. It's called Game Feel, and it really obviously focuses more on games. Two excellent reads. So if there were uh, only a few things you should take away from this talk, um, it's that, do you see that guy? I spent so much time on that. Um, yeah, the, uh, micro interactions. Um, micro interactions improve your user experience, and they help define your game's identity. That that's what people are probably going to remember, whether they know it or not, or, or can put words on it. That's that's what's going to stick, I think. And when doing that, you want to make your core mechanics uh, especially awesome. I think we should just wait for him to come back. Thank you. We're hiring uh, at Ubisoft Montreal. Uh, actually, don't come and see me about it because I'm not an HR person, but uh, there's like a website I think you can go and uh, you can also come to see me, but I won't be able to hire you like on the spot. Um, and thanks a lot for being here. Uh, and if you've got questions, we've got 11 minutes, and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.